bats, how are you? Welcome back to my channel, or welcome if you're new. So, today I'll be narrating something pretty exciting. It is a translation um, that a awesome viewer of mine translated for me. I want to thank them, and uh, that's how they wanted to be credited. And this story is called The Game of Crickets. I love being able to share stories that folks may not know from uh, English-speaking communities as much, and uh, I'm very honored to have the opportunity to read it. Before I get started, disclaimers, the opinions of the characters in the story are the characters' opinions, not the narrator's. So if you hear some uh, rude ways of people being described, that's the character. All of that said, let's get started. And, the gentleman asked when Professor Glossinius entered more quickly than usual. Did they deliver the letters? Is Johanna Scoper traveling back to Europe? How is he? Did a collection arrive with the mail? They all inquired at the same time. Only this, said the professor very seriously. Placing on the table a package of handwritten sheets and a small jar where a dead insect of whitish color about the size of a stag beetle, could be seen. The Chinese ambassador handed it over to me personally with a clarification that it had arrived this morning via Denmark. I'm afraid he has heard some unpleasant news about our colleague Scoper, a gentleman with a shaved beard whispered in the ear of an elderly professor with a wavy lion-like mane, a director like himself at the Museum of Natural Sciences, who had taken off his glasses he observed the creature inside the jar with some profound interest. That was a very peculiar enclosure in which the men, six in total, and all of them scientific investigators of the Lepidoptera and Coleoptera species, were seated around a wide and long table. The mixture of the smells of camphor and sandalwood accentuated the strangely mortuary climate that emanated from the diodes that hung from the rope fixed to the ceiling. With their glassy and bulging eyes, they seemed very off-putting, complimenting the truncated heads of ghostly spectators. The devilish masks of insular tribes, ostrich eggs, gigantic shark jaws, narwhal teeth, twisted monkeys, and tons of other thousands of grotesque shapes and figures from faraway zones. On the walls, above the gnawed brown cupboards that had something monkish about them under the sun of the afternoon, hung lovingly framed in gold similarly to portraits of venerable ancestors, were full-color charts of beetles in gigantic proportions. With one of his little hands extended in a cordial gesture, a timid smile accompanying his little round eyes and button-shaped nose, a stuffed dormouse peeked out obsequiously from an angle of the classroom where he was on display. He had on a high-top hat placed by one of the dissectors on his head, and the bearing of a village mayor, who a scientist himself photographed for the first time in his life. Meanwhile, nearby a few viper skins were swaying. A hidden tail among the most distant shadows of the corridor led to a 12 meters long crocodile, ready to receive a new coat of enamel. This would comply with the wish of the Minister of Education, because after all, it was the pride of the entire institute. Professor Golsinius had taken a seat, untied the ribbon that held the handwritten pages together, and glanced quickly over the first few lines, muttering something aloud. This is dated in Bhutan, in the southeast of Tibet, the 19th of July, 1914, that is, four weeks before the outbreak of war, from which it came to be inferred that this letter took more than a year to reach our hands. Then, he added after a short pause, our colleague, Johanna Scoper, writes here, among other things, the following. On another occasion, I will tell you in more detail the rich booty that I was able to obtain during my long travels through Chinese borderlands, passing through Assam up to Bataan, a still unexplored country. Today, I just want to refer as succinctly as possible to the amazing circumstances to which I owe the discovery of a white cricket as you will see completely new. Professor Glossinius pointed to the insect in the jar while reading these last words, and that the shamans use for religious purposes under the name of fat, a word that serves them as an insult to anything resembling a European or individual of white race. Well then, 
A certain morning, I found out, through some laminous pilgrims who were headed to Lhasa, that near my camp there was a high exponent of the Dugpas, something like priests of the devil feared throughout the entire territory of Tibet, recognizable by their scarlet caps, and who claimed to be direct descendants of the mushroom demon. The truth is that these Dugpas belong to the ancient Tibetan religion of the Lamaists and shamans of which we know little and nothing, and they are children of a strange race whose origins go back to the night of time. This Dugpa, the pilgrims told me as they fervently and superstitiously spin their prayer mill, is a Sam Shmishaba, a being who should no longer be designated as a man, who can bind and unbind, someone that, to put in a few words, thanks to his faculty to see beyond time and space, he can do anything he proposes himself to do on this earth. They exist, so they told me, two ways to reach those heights that surpass all human powers. One, which is the path of light, the blending with Buddha, and the opposite, the way of the left hand, which only has access to a Dugpa by birth. And that comes to be a spiritual way full of horror and fright. These born Dogpas can appear, although very rarely, in any of the cardinal points, and are almost always the children of extremely religious parents. It would seem, the pilgrim who confessed all these things to me thought, that the hand of the Lord of Shadows placed a poisonous branch in the Tree of Holiness in these cases. It turns out that only one way exists to know whether or not a child is spiritually linked to the League of Dugpa. The swirl of hair we all have on the crown of our head should spin from left to right, instead of doing it in the inverse direction. I immediately expressed, out of pure curiosity, my desire to personally meet the high-ranking Dugpa, who was around the surroundings, but my caravan leader, who was also East Tibetan, adamantly refused. It's pure nonsense, he shouted. In the whole territory of Bataan, there is not a single Dugpa, without taking into account that no Dugpa, and much less a Sam Shmichabas, would agree to show his arts to a being of white race. The overly emphatic opposition of this man woke an increasing suspicion within me. After a very long and astute questioning, I was able to extract from him that he himself practiced the religion of the Bonzos. He was perfectly aware of something amiss, and eventually he told me. Because of the reddish tint from the vapors given off by the earth, at least that's what he led me to believe, there was a Dugpa in the surroundings of the camp. But it would never consent to offer you a sample of his arts, he kept repeating without stopping. Why not? I kept asking. Because it wouldn't assume the responsibility. What kind of responsibility? I wanted to know. It happens that the disturbances this would cause in the realm of reincarnation would throw him back into the vortex of reincarnations, if something much worse does not happen. I was interested to know more about the mysterious religion of the Dugpas, so I asked him, Does man, according to your religion, have a soul? Yes and no. How is that? For all answer, the Tibetan pulled out, from the ground, a blade of grass and tied it in a knot. Does this blade have a knot? Yes. He untied the knot. And now? Now it does not have it. In the same way, man has a soul and does not have it, he affirmed with all simplicity. I tried to face that thing another way to get a clearer idea of his way of thinking. All right, now let's suppose that when crossing that terribly dangerous gorge, you had fallen into the abyss. Would your soul have kept living or not? I wouldn't have fallen. Making a new attempt, I showed him my revolver. And if I killed you with a bullet, would you keep living or not? You can't kill me. Of course I can. Well then, try to do it. Not happening. This fellow is crazy, I thought to myself. That would be a good mess. Travel through this limitless mountainous terrain without our caravan leader. He seemed to have guessed my thoughts and smiled. Not without a certain sarcasm, of course. It was maddening. I was silent for a long while. 
What happens is that you can't want, he said finally, breaking the silence. Behind your will are an infinite number of desires, some you know and some you don't, and all of them are stronger than you. What, then, is the soul according to your religion? I asked him angrily. Do I, for example, have a soul? Yes. And if I die, my soul continues to live? No. But yours does after your death, yes? Yes, because I have a name. I also have one. Yes, but you don't know your true name. Therefore, you don't have it. What you consider your own name is nothing more than an empty word invented by your parents. When you sleep, you forget it. I don't forget my name when I sleep. But when you're dead, you won't know it either, I replied. No, but the master knows it and will never forget it. And when he calls me by my true name, I will get up again. Only me and no other, because I am the only one who bears my name. No one else but me. It has. What you say is your name. Many others have in common with you, just like dogs. He ended up muttering contemptuously, and if I understood his last words well, I let him believe that it had not been like that. And what do you understand by master? I asked him incredulously. The Samshe Meshiba. The one who is now almost our neighbor? Yes, but it is only his reflection that is now near this camp. The one that he really is is everywhere, and he can be nowhere if he wants to. Does that mean you can become invisible? I had to smile in spite myself. Do you want to insinuate that sometimes it is inside the world we live in, and sometimes outside it? That sometimes it is in, and sometimes it is not. A name is also only there when it is pronounced. And when it is not pronounced, it is no more, was the Tibetan's response. And can you, for example, also become a master? Yes. So then there would be two masters, right? I was feeling triumphant, since, to put it openly, the guy's arrogance was annoying me. Now I had him well caught up in the trap. My next question followed. If one of the masters was to make the sun shine, and the other wanted to make it rain, which one wins? I was all the more perplexed by what was said next. If I ever become a master, I will become the Samshe Mishiba. Or do you think that there can be two things that are totally similar to each other without being the same thing? No matter what you say, in such a case, there would be two and not one. If I came across both of you, there would be two people. I would see, and not just one. I contradicted him. The Tibetan crouched down, chose among the calcite crystals that were scattered on the ground one of special transparency, and said to me with a sneer, Place this in front of your eye, and look at the tree. You see it double. Isn't that true? But because of that... Have they become two trees instead of one? At the time, I did not know what to answer him, nor would it have been easy for me to express myself in the Mongolian language, which was the only one we could use for our mutual understanding, with the fluency and logic necessary to address a subject as intricate as this. Therefore, I had to let him believe that victory was his. But inwardly, I was amazed beyond measure by the spiritual agility of this half-savage being. What with how he dressed in that dirty lamb skin. There is something strange about these Asians from the mountains. On the outside, they look like animals, but as soon as one touches their little soul, the philosopher appears. I went back to the starting point. Do you think that the Dugpa would refuse to show me his arts because he rejects the responsibility? No, he sure wouldn't. But what if I am the one who assumes all the responsibility? For the first time since I had met him, the Tibetan was taken aback. His face twisted into disdain so potent that I knew it could not be fabricated. An expression of savage cruelty, inexplicable to me, alternated with another of deep joy. In all these months that we had been together, we had spent a whole week in the danger of death, we had crossed chasms that would fill anyone with panic, passing over bamboo bridges barely a foot wide, 
and more than once it seemed to me that my heart paralyzed. We had crossed deserts and almost died of thirst, and he had never lost, not for just a single minute, his inner balance. And now? What could be the cause that made him go so out of himself? Just looking at him was enough for me to know that in his mind the ideas were agitated in a crazy whirlwind. Lead me to the Dugpa, and I'll reward you immensely, I tried again. I want to think about it, he finally answered. It was still nighttime when he entered my tent to wake me up. He had already made up his mind, he told me, and he was willing. I had saddled two of our Hurston Mongolian horses, whose height is not much taller than a large dog, and we interned into the night. The men of my caravan were still sound asleep around the nearly extinguished campfires scattered across the terrain. Hours passed without us exchanging a single word. That peculiar aroma of musk that the Tibetan steppes exhale during the July nights and the monotonous murmur of the brush as it was swept away by the feet of our horses almost intoxicated me in such a way. It was as if, in order to stay awake, I was obligated to not take my eyes off of the stars, that here, in this wild land, I needed something flaming, as if they were glowing pieces of paper. From them an exciting influence emanates that makes one's heart uncomfortable. When the first light of dawn began to climb behind the mountaintops, I was able to notice that the Tibetans' eyes were kept wide open, without blinking, always with his sights fixated at a single point in the sky. I observed that his mind wasn't all that there. I asked him several times if he knew where to find the Dugpa so well to not pay attention to the path, but I received no answer at all. He attracts me like magnetic stone attracts iron, he finally babbled, as if coming out of a very deep sleep. Not even at midday, we took a break. Always mute, my companion returned to hasten his horse's step every time it showed a little slower. I was forced to eat my goat meat ration while sitting in the saddle. Shortly before nightfall, we stopped, turning at the bottom of a totally bare hill near those fantastic tents that sometimes can be seen in Bhutan. They are black, hexagonal below and pointed above, with warped edges, and they stand on a kind of stilts in such a way that they resemble huge spiders that touch the ground with their bellies. I expected to find a dirty shaman with disheveled hair and beard, one of those insanity or epileptic creatures that frequent among the Mongols and Tungstanians who get drunk on infusions made by cooking certain mushrooms and then believe they are seeing spirits, or they feel impelled to spew out incomprehensible prophecies. Instead of that, I see standing before me, motionless, a man a good six feet tall, surprisingly thin, beardless, with an olive glow to his face, a color such as I have never seen in a living human being, the separation between his eyes being so great that he seemed unnatural to me, a specimen of human race totally unknown to me. His lips, smooth as porcelain, just like the skin of his entire face, were very red, fine as the edge of a knife, and so, so curved, especially in the very raised corners, as if frozen in a merciless smile that seemed to have been drawn with a brush on his face. It was impossible for me to take my eyes off that man for a long time, and, looking back on it now, I would almost say that I was feeling like a child whose breath catches with fear at the sudden appearance of a terrifying mask emerging from the shadows. On his head, the Dugpa wore a scarlet cap, while the rest of his body was covered ankle-deep in expensive sable cloak dyed entirely orange. He and my guide never spoke once to each other, but I still believe that they understood each other through secret gestures and signals since, without asking me at all what I wanted from him, Nadugpa suddenly said that he was willing to show me everything I wanted, as long as I expressingly agreed to assume all responsibility, even without knowing it. I, of course, declared my immediate agreement. 
As proof of that, I had to touch the soil with my left hand, which I did. He then went ahead of us in silence for a short distance, and we followed him until he ordered us to sit down. We sat down at the edge of a rise of earth that looked curiously like a table. Did I carry a white canvas with me? I began searching desperately in all of my pockets, but nothing, until I finally found, hidden in the torn bottom of my jacket, an old folding map of Europe, already quite faded, which I had evidently carried with me without knowing it during my entire trip through Asia. I spread it between us and explained to the Dugpa that the drawing represented a map of my homeland. They exchanged a quick glance with my guide, and again I could see the expression on the Tibetan's face, that malignant expression, one could almost say hateful, which had attracted my attention so much the night before. They asked me if I wanted to see the magical game of crickets. I nodded and knew instantly what I was going to witness. That famous trick that consists of making various insects appear under the influence of a hiss or something similar. Just like that, I was not mistaken. The dugpa let out a soft metallic screeching sound, which these people achieve by using a little silver bell hidden in their clothes, and immediately a bunch of crickets were coming out of their nooks and crannies within the earth to meet up on the map. More and more as time passes, an infinity of them. I was already getting angry just thinking of that because of a ridiculous circus trick, which I had already had the opportunity to witness several times in China. I would have undertaken such a laborious ride, but the spectacle that from then on was offered before my eyes made up for it. The crickets not only belonged to a species totally unknown to science, which made them interesting in itself, but also behaved in a more than peculiar way. As soon as they made contact with the drawing on the map, they began to run haphazardly in all directions later forming groups that examined each other with distrust. Suddenly, a patch of rainbow-colored light fell on the very center of the map. It came, as I at once realized, from a small glass prism that the Dugpa held against the sun, and in a few seconds, the passive crickets became an accumulation of insects tearing each other apart in the most abominable manner. The spectacle was too repulsive to even think of describing it. The screeching of the thousands and thousands of wings gave a very high tone, almost melodious, which reached me to the marrow of my bones. Although it resembled the cricket song that we all know, it was composed of such infernal hatred mixed with a type of lament cry, so atrocious that I know I will never be able to forget it. Beneath that mass of bodies, a thick greenish juice was starting to spill. I ordered the Dugpa to immediately stop this brutality, but he had already put the prism away and just answered me with a shrug. In vain, I strived to separate the crickets with a stick, their mad desire to kill no longer knowing limits. Even more of them appeared. They came in troops to participate in this macabre game until they formed a vibrant, kicking mountain almost as tall as a man. The ground found itself covered with the crazed insects that formed a whitish mass that desired to reach the center, moved by a single thought. Kill. 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 Some crickets that were falling badly injured from the pile and could not get back up destroyed themselves with their antenna. The screeching was at times so loud and so frighteningly high-pitched that I had to cover my ears with my hands because I was sure I couldn't take it any longer. Finally, thank God, the animals seemed to be fewer, and the lions coming out from under the ground were getting more and more sparse until they ceased completely. And now what do you propose? I asked the Tibetan when I saw that the Dugpa showed no intention of giving the meaning of what just occurred. Instead, he seemed to be making an effort to keep his thoughts focused on who knows what. His upper lip was contracted in a way that his sharp, pointy teeth could be clearly seen. They were as black as tar, I suspect from chewing leaves and grass so much, a widespread custom in these zones. 
bind and unbind, I heard the Tibetan answer me. Despite that, I kept repeating to myself that it was nothing more than insects that had met such a horrendous death here. I couldn't help but feeling overly impressed, so much so that at times I thought I was disappearing, and the voice continued to reach me very far, bind and unbind. I could not understand its meaning and still do not understand it to this day, nor can it be said that after what has already been told, something worthy of being taken into special account happened. Why would it be, then, that I remained sitting there? It might have been hours. I don't know. It was as if the will to get up had disappeared from my body. I can't define it in any other way. Little by little, the sun was sinking, and both the earthy and celestial landscapes began to acquire that completely unusual red and orange tint that anyone who has ever been to Tibet knows so well. The color of this chart is only comparable to that of the tents that can be found in European pilgrimages. I couldn't detach from the words, bind and unbind. Gradually, they were acquiring in my brain a frightful sense of truth. In my imagination, the compact and enormous bulge of crickets turned into millions of agonizing soldiers. I suddenly felt as if my throat was being strangled by a mysterious and immeasurable sense of responsibility, whose torment was even greater for the same reason that it was impossible for me to find its origin. For a moment, I had the impression that the Dugpo was gone, and that in his place, I had before me, scarlet and olive green, the abominable statue of the Tibetan god of war, Begtis. I was able to fight against that vision until, once again, I had the reality before my eyes, as it was. But reality was not enough for me. The vapors rising from the earth, the jagged snow-capped mountaintops against the horizon, the dugpa in its scarlet cap, myself in my half-European and half-Asian clothing, and finally that black tent with its spider legs, all those things could not be real. Reality, fantasy, fiction, what was true, what was a lie? And to top it all off was that tormenting sensation that my thoughts opened up, leaving a large hollow space every time the fear of that new, inexplicable, terrible sense of RESPONSIBILITY harassed me again. Later, much later, during my return trip, this event grew in my memory like a luxuriant poisonous plant that I tried to vanquish. At night, when I can't get to sleep, the vague sensation of being about to understand the meaning of the phrase bind and unbind begins to take shape in me, and then I try to asphyxiate it so that it cannot mature in the same way that one tries to put out a fire before it spreads. But there is no use defending myself. In my imagination, I can see how a reddish vapor rises from the pile of dead crickets, forming into clouds darkening in the sky like loosely clouds brought by a monsoon, and it rushes to the west. And right now, as I write these lines, I feel something that I... 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 Here, the letter breaks off, said Professor Glossinius. Unfortunately, I now have to communicate to you that the Chinese embassy gave me the unfortunate news of the death of our esteemed colleague Johannes Scoper, which happened in the Far East. Before the professor could continue, a loud shout interrupted him. It can't be. The cricket is still alive after a whole year. Incredible. Catch him, it flies. They all yelled at the same time. The professor with the lion's mane had uncorked the jar, letting out the apparently dead insect. A moment after all this uproar, the cricket had flown out of the window and into the garden, and the serious scientific men, in their rush to hunt it down, almost ran over the museum porter who had come to light up the lamps in the teacher's room. Shaking his head thoughtfully, the old man watched those strange characters in the garden trying to chase down a small flying insect. Then he looked up at the evening sky, ruminating to himself, the shapes that clouds can take in these times of war. There is one that looks like a man with a red cap and green face. If it was not because the eyes are so far apart, one would say that it is just like a human being. Really, at my age, all I need is to become superstitious. 
And that ends the game of crickets. I may get other stories to narrate after the translation happens. I did end up editing some parts to fix the grammar, so if there are some things lost in translation, I apologize. But it was a really interesting story and tells a lot about the horrors of war and what the responsibility really means with the person who had written the letter, so um, people can take their own interpretations. It's very interesting. And I look forward to narrating more stories in the future. Please like this video and comment what you would like to see me narrate in the future as well, if you would like. And of course, like and subscribe if you enjoy my content. That said, have a nice night or day wherever it is for you folks.